The Lost Frost Girl by Amy Wilson. Chapter 23. Saturday morning is a bit lazy, and I guess I'm happy with that. Mom's gone out on a trek with some friends to soak up the winter spirit in the deepest glens or something. And normally I'd see Mallory, but she hasn't gotten in touch with me. So I'm trying my best to sleep it all off while thoughts and memories of yesterday crash over me, mingling with my dreams. By the time I open the curtains in my room, it's nearly noon. Pale sunlight makes shadows sharp on the pavements, and any sign of my frost adventures with Jack last night have long since burned away. I watch for a while, doodling in my art book, spiral eyes of exhausted owls who scatter autumn leaves with their wings while shadows loom in the corners. And that's when I see it. A small pale figure standing in the shadows opposite, staring up at me. It's only the size of a small child, but clearly not a child at all. It's completely hairless, its bony limbs too long for its body, its gray skin glinting in the daylight. Large, lamplight eyes look straight at me. I force myself to keep on looking, though it sends a shiver over my skin. And then it grins, revealing those wicked, sharp teeth I thought I'd imagined. I flinch away despite myself, and when I look again, it's gone. But it was something! I tell myself fiercely, dimly aware that the temperature of the room has dropped by a couple of degrees, that there is now frost on the inside of the window pane. It, it was, it was, clacks the wooden owl in the bedpost. I turn in shock and bend down to study it more closely. It blinks, making me start. Mom carved it into the bedpost when I was a kid and scared of the dark. It's supposed to be my guardian. And now it's speaking to me, or, or my mind is playing tricks on me. Either way, there's definitely something weird going on, with carved creatures talking to me, and fairy creatures following me. Okay, I say to myself, sitting on the edge of the bed. So there's Jack, and the North Wind, and Avery, who wants me to be sensible. And there's a whole royal fay court of Mother Earth, and these things watching me. Are they the royal court? Are they keeping an eye on me, making sure I believe? What do they want? I look at the owl, demanding an answer, but it's silent. There must be a reason they're watching me. And if I'm powerless to do anything about Jack or anything else, then perhaps I can at least do something about that before they turn me into a gibberish wreck. I spend most of the day at the window, pretending to do homework, waiting to see another one of the creatures. Mom drags me out to the kitchen for dinner when she gets home. She's brought vegan turnovers back from the wilds, and she asks after Mallory. It makes me squirm a bit. I can't remember the last time we didn't speak for this long. But I say something about her spending time with her mom and try to put it into the back of my mind. I'll fix it when I know how. After that, our conversation is muted, and I can tell she's itching to get back to work in her studio. She's got the distracted glaze in her eyes. Are you all right, my love? She asks as I finish drying dishes and fling the towel on the hook. You seem down. We were going to have that talk. Shall I leave my work for now? I'm just tired, I say with a smile. I was going to read for a bit and have an early night. Can we talk another time? She looks at me appraisingly. It'll keep. She nods. Go safely there in your dreams. She smiles, reaching forward and giving me a quick hug. I lean into her for a second, taking comfort in her warmth. And when I pull back, I do feel a bit better. A bit more like I can deal with this, whatever it might be. She did, after all. Thanks, Mom. I watch out the window till my eyes ache, and I'm seeing monsters everywhere. I watch as cars pull in, pull out again as my neighbors welcome guests with wide smiles, as two arched, arch-backed cats have a standoff in the middle of the road. And then I see it, deep in the shadows, its lamp-like eyes glowing. I move as stealthily as I can from the window, getting up from the desk slowly and sneaking out the bedroom door. The light's still on upstairs, and I creep through the rest of the apartment, letting myself out with a soft click on the front door and running down the steps to the main entrance where I hesitate. Door cranked open until I see the creature again. It scrabbles up onto a low wall, its eyes fixed on my window. 
and then scuttles down and off along the road, keeping to the shadows. I grit my teeth and sneak through the front yard and over the road, following when it turns into one of the back streets toward the park, stealing myself for discovery at any second. Hey, comes a whisper, just as I get to the field, making me jump out of my skin. What are you doing? I turn to see Avery coming toward me and flap at him, hissing at him to be quiet before the creature spots us. He's quick on his feet and looks like he's been running, his hair tousled, breath tight. What's wrong? I whisper, pulling him into the shadows over me. Nothing. I felt bad. I shouldn't have left you with Jack last night. But what are you doing now? I'm following one of the creatures. What? His eyes bore into me. Look, over there. I point at the little figure, now halfway up the massive oak tree, its glittering skin lit by the moon. I was right. They are following me. I've decided to follow back to find out why they keep spying on me. That is not a very good idea, he whispers, and even in the dark I can make out a scowl on his face. Why not? I'm not making it up, Avery. Look, what is that even? I point at the inhuman figure as it scuttles through the branches. It looks like a goblin, one of the royal court servants. I guess they're more curious than I thought they'd be. Elementals don't normally have children. Maybe they have been watching you. Well, I don't like being spied on. I want to know what they're saying about me, I tell him, shuffling forward as the creature begins to leap from tree to tree ahead of us. In the distance looms the old druid wood, where Mallory and I used to go camping on for an afternoon, our backs, bags packed with potato chips and apples and flashlights. You can either help me or go away. I'm fed up with sitting at home worrying about everything and not knowing what's going on. Avery swears under his breath. What is it? I demand, my eyes focused on the small figure start, still darting ahead. Why are you so worried? I'm not worried. It's late and you're chasing ideas with no basis. So don't come. It's fine, really. Just leave me to my lunacy and I'll catch up with you at school. I wink at him and scurry forward, deeper into the little tangle of trees and toward the woodland, the goblin always just within sight. After a moment, and with a low huff, Avery follows me, and I'm glad of it, though I'd never say that to him. My breath is tight, and my skin feels a size too small for me. I'm aware that there's ice in the creases of my wrists and elbows and knees, that my hair is crusted with frost. I crouch, ignoring it, while Avery's breath steams in the air next to me. We found them. In a little clearing in the middle of the wood, where the trees are tightly knit and thrust their roots out to trip careless feet. Suddenly, the pale figure of the royal court servant was joined by two other taller figures whose features I can't make out in the darkness. We should just make our move. This is tedious, and I'll be out of my season before much longer. A man's low voice, low and barbed with impatience. It sounds too deep to be that of the creature we followed. This is a long, the long game, my dear friend, replies a woman's soft voice. We must know all we can before we go any further. We need the sympathy of the whole royal court on our side. The goblins aren't bringing anything useful, and unless she's very stupid, she's going to spot one at some point. I don't know why you insist upon them. She's... There's a shifting of feet and clearing, and I try to peer through. But Avery is in the way and seemingly oblivious, caught up in it himself. He shuffles back as I get closer thrusting me farther into a gnarly old bush. I miss whatever the man was going to say about me as I try to struggle out struggle out without making any noise. I glare at him in a what are you doing outraged sort of way, and he indicates the clearing, gesturing impatiently to his ears and then his eyes and putting a finger over his lips to shut me up. Not that I was going to say anything. I turn away from him and try to pick up their voices again. We will need all the evidence we can find. It's no small thing we're attempting here. And before you start yowling again, remember we're in this together. We set the trap and now there's no escape. We have everything we need to destroy him. It's just a matter of timing. We want the same thing after all, to be rid of Jack and his invasion upon our seasons with his infernal frost. She is the key to it all. Now then. What have you for us today, Sparling? 
She is keen-eyed, my queen, comes a thin whisper, and she has a guardian. I could not work out which. I caught a sense of it from my window. She has been active with Jack, out at night playing with their art. She is trusting humans are. Well, that will go in our favor at least, says the queen. You see, dear friend, your own project may well bear fruit. How does he fare? I believe it is going well, replies the man. I wonder if we should ask. Suddenly, after all his warnings to me about keeping quiet, Avery loses his balance and treads heavily, snapping the brittle frozen twigs beneath our feet. A sudden bloom of silence seems to stretch around us. Avery looks at me, panic written all over his face. Run! he hisses, rushing toward me, grabbing me by the arm, and pulling me through whipping branches and over the frozen ground until we are back on the park. He doesn't stop there either. His feet fly and mine are forced to follow, stumbling, breath like fire in my lungs, until we're back in the well-lit suburban streets around the park. What happened? I demand when we finally stop. I pull away from him and lean up against a fence, heart pounding. I'm sorry, he says with a wind spending to recover his breath. My foot went numb, and I knew they'd have heard, heard me crashing about. I didn't want us to get caught. But... They were just about to say something important. I know they were. I sigh and try not to let go of the frustration. It wasn't really his fault. Who were they? One of them was the queen. The queen of May, he says. I'm not sure what she's trying to achieve with all this, but she's a schemer, and she's not a fan of Jack. Spring versus winter, I suppose. Who was the man with her? I shudder at the memory of his harsh and caring voice. Don't know, says Avery, closing his eyes and leaning his head back against the fence. I have no idea what they're all doing. Well, they're trying to get rid of Jack. I'll have to warn him. Do you really have to? He asks. What's he done for you, Owl? How do you know it wouldn't all be better without him? Do you think it would be? What's he done that's so wrong anyway? He's too wild. Some say he's forgotten why he does what he does. He's destructive. But he's Jack Frost. How can you get rid of him? Isn't he just being what he should be? Doing his work? I'm not getting involved. He says, shaking his head, and if I were you, I'd stay out of it. I watch him walk away, slope-shouldered but still tall, and somehow incongruous against the pale dawn, his tawny hair like a burning challenge to winter itself. Chapter 24, Fables and Earth Spirits, The Queen of May. It was a paradise, and she was entranced by it. The sky was endless blue, and the air rang with the chatter of small bright birds. Green fields stretched out in every direction. Tiny flowers of color nestled like stars within their folds. The girl's heart soared to see such a place. And then the mistress of it all appeared before her, and she was caught by the desolation in those green eyes, by the yearning that gleamed there. What creature are you to come before me thus? The lady hissed. Porcelain skin flushed red with rage as she looked her up and down. How do you dare to appear here without invitation? I am, I am just, stop staring! Thou art like a frightened child. The lady thrust her hands out as if the girl's presence caused her pain, her blossom pink hair swirling around her face. She took a deep breath. The world around them seemed to dim and contract, and then all blazed forth once more, green and bountiful. New life was everywhere here, from the buds on the trees to the baby rabbits that bounced around there. Small figures giggled in the shade of rose bushes, and for a moment the girl wondered if they were children, but they were not. Their skin was palest gray, their little teeth serrated. They were nothing human at all. Do not be afraid, the lady said then with a sudden bright smile that made the girl's head swim. You catch me out of season. It is a hard time for me. Out of season? I am the Queen of May. I am spring, 
she howled, stamping a bare foot, as clouds gathered in the cornflower sky. Her fists clenched at her sides, the skirt of her dress swelling out in a sudden wind. You come to me when your world is stuck in the depths of bitter winter and expect to find me welcoming? No, I, forgive me, I did not know where I was. I only sought to, to what? To torture me with reminders of a world where I am not welcome? You tread daily on the solid earth. You have no limits, no bounds. And I am here with only what I create for company, trapped until my season rings once more. Does it seem fair to you? Does it? Her voice rose to a screech, and the creatures around them froze, their eyes fixed on the girl accusingly. Fix this, they seemed to say. You have spoiled our play with your wretched humanity. No, my lady, please. The girl twisted her hands and wished herself away, but it did not work. She had never been able to discover the trick of leaving these places at will. The sky darkened, and then it was as if the queen grew bored of her temper once more. Her countenance changed entirely, and the world brightened with her. Come, she said presently, sweeping to a bench tucked away in a bower, of sweet smelling honeysuckle she sat and gazed about with another dazzling intoxicating smile come my goblin friends gather come human i shall tell you tales of my season on the earth that shall cheer us all the girl never did know how long she was in that paradise the time is ever different when one is abroad with the fay it felt like half a lifetime, and she grew almost fond of the mischievous goblins that courted their lady and made her laugh with their spiteful little tricks. But as for the fickle Queen of May, she would be very glad if she never saw her like again. Chapter 25 Owl! Mallory whispers as she opens her front door. What are you doing? It was early morning already and I'm exhausted and disoriented. My feet found their own way here. I'm almost as surprised as she is to find myself on her doorstep. Your ma is freaking out, and why don't you have a coat on? You've got bare arms out in the snow. She's making my head ache, ache with all the exclamation marks. Can I come in? She looks toward the kitchen where the radio was on, and puts a finger to her lips before pulling me in and hustling me up the stairs. Nice soft carpet, nice warm house, the familiar smell of baking. Now that I'm here, I don't know where to start. There's so much to fill her in on, and that's if she wants to hear it. Sorry about before, I mumble as we get into her room. I crawl up onto her bed. Nice, clean, warm blankets, lots of pillows. Mallory has a nice room. Little cherries on the wallpaper. Everything's clean and white and organized in plastic vials on polished shelves. It's okay, she says in a small voice. I'm sorry, too. She lingers in the doorway as if she doesn't know whether to stay or go. She's wearing pajamas with cupcakes on them. Sure you don't mind me coming over? I ask eventually through the strained silence. No, I don't know, she says. Where have you been all night anyway? Everyone's in a panic, Owl. Are you okay? You have to tell me what's really going on. I can't cope with all you getting distant. She blinks hard. Everything's falling apart, she whispers. Mom and Dad are having all these tense phone conversations and you're keeping things from me and I know that's up to you and you've got your own stuff, but it doesn't feel, nothing feels the same anymore. I pull her down next to me on the bed. I'm sorry, I say, watching her struggle not to cry, feeling awful because I've been so absorbed in my stuff that I haven't really thought about how everything has changed for her, not properly. I'm sorry about your mom and dad. I'm sorry I haven't been here for you. Stop, she says firmly, taking a deep breath and turning to face me. I've had enough talking about me. Tell me what's going on with you. I struggle for a minute 
All the events of the last couple of days piling up in my mind, confusing everything. Then I decide to start at the beginning and go from there. Honestly, I'm not sure how much of this is madness she'll be able to take anyway. I've never seen her so fragile. I found my father, I say. Her face lights up. You did? Tell me. What's he like? He's a bit... He's not quite the usual, I mean. He's Jack Frost, I blurt. She grins, ha ha, nice one. Did she really just, did she really tell you or are you trying to distract me from all my own stuff? Ugh. Oh. I look down at the pale carpet, wondering what to say next. I can't think of anything. I'm not kidding, Mail. So your father is Jack Frost? She peers at me and I lift my head, trying not to re react, trying to fend off the shudder in my spine, the rush of ice behind my eyes. The Jack Frost? As in kids stories you're really telling me in total seriousness that your mom says he's your father yes i breathe a little flurry of ice escaping my mouth as i say it she flinches back eyes wide but how is that mallory her mom's voice her footsteps on the stairs what's going on who do you have up there i huddle into the corner of the bed and pull a pillow over my face uh wait a minute says Mallory, shaking her head. I'll get mom to call yours. Let her know you're here. I'm not going home yet, I say, dreading the thought of facing mom. I'll see what I can do, she says. Anyway, I want to know what's going on with you before you go anywhere. She looks at me, cowering behind the pillow, and shakes her head again. I'll get us some tea. You must be half frozen. I am half frozen, I crow, bursting out into a weird gasping laughter that tears out of my throat. Oh, God, Owl, what am I going to do with you? Just let me get some tea and then we'll work it out. I love Mallory. I close my eyes and wake with a start when she comes back in with two steaming mugs of tea and a plate of toasted bagels. I watch her clatter about for a bit <clears throat> and try to clear my mind of dreams. They dance before my eyes still, old men with blue eyes, snow in my face and skating on ice, frost sweeping across rooftops at all the time a finger my father's face his expression always slightly mocking and strange figures leading me onto thin ice where avery waits for me so jack frost mallory says eventually sitting on the bed her eyes flicking over me yep and this is what you've been hiding i nod i didn't know how to tell you i, I suppose that's not surprising she says grabbing a bagel and pulling her laptop over she peers at me, frowning. Not if you really believe your father is Jack Frost. I try to explain what he's like as the mug of tea warms me from the inside. I'm so disoriented that I do a really bad job of it. I keep stumbling over words and forgetting things and having to go back and fill bits in. To Mallory's credit, she just sits and listens, and though her eyes boggle a bit, she doesn't laugh or tell me I'm mad. Her tea goes cold. The bagel's still in her hand, forgotten, as I try to make her understand. Well, I ask, when I'm done telling her about him and what I've learned about the Fey world searching her for clues, what do you think? She purses her lips, looking out the window at the frozen world now gleaming beneath the clear sky. Do you think I'm making all this up? No, she says in a subdued voice. I know you were out all night, and that you arrived not looking in the slightest bit cold and something's been up with your body temperature and all the sparkling and you know your mom's stories and then you are cold owl she peers at me your eyes troubled maybe you should google jack frost see if we can find out more about him i already did it's just a load of nonsense well i'm doing it anyway maybe there'll be something you missed that can explain it all somehow she says I grab one of the bagels, closing my eyes while she starts tapping away. She's humoring me, I can tell. Maybe she thinks I'm losing it and she's playing along in case I freak out altogether. I guess I can't really blame her. Hmm, this is a load of nonsense, she says after a few minutes, but also some good stuff. She reads me an old poem about Jack Frost, icing windows and lakes, making the world all beautiful and then destroying a bowl of fruit in a pitcher, which sounds about right. The north wind was there too. I mumble, opening my eyes to see her now scrolling through images of white-haired boys who don't look a bit like my father. Did I say 
Yes, of course he was, she says, shooting me a quizzical look. Let's focus on your dad for now, though, shall we? One mythical creature at a time? Okay. Mallory's mom pops her head around the door. I've spoken to your mom, she says, tucking her hair behind her ears. She looks a bit tired, but apart, her, but apart from what she's as pristine as ever, just like the house, I wonder what it'd be like to have a mom like that, parents like Mallory's. I told her you're here safe. Thank you. She's been very worried, Owl. She's expecting you at home before too long. Okay, I whisper looking down. At least she knows where you are now, she says, looking from me to Mallory. She's being nice to me. She thinks that she can make up for everything else, Mallory says when she disappeared, closing the door behind her. Oh, Mal. She waves a hand and turns back to the computer, and I get it. She wants to get absorbed in something else, anything about what's going on with her mom and dad. So we're back to Jack Frost. There's a Norse legend about a frost giant, and in some cultures, he's also known as Old Man Winter. Then we look up what a frost, what frost is good for. There's not a lot of evidence it's actually good for anything. Actually, just lots about frost being bad for gardeners and fruit. So basically, he is an inhuman creature who goes around killing tomatoes and causing trouble for people, I say, holding my arms and leaning back against the wall. Sounds about right, really. He's not terribly warm, Mallory snorts. No, but I mean in the kind way. He's a bit of a joker. Well, but you don't know him yet, do you? Not just from one night? She frowns at me, then takes a deep breath and turns back to the computer. A anyway... Isn't there also something about frost protecting Earth from winter? I'm sure. I, I mean, everything in nature has a purpose, doesn't it? She's a bit of an environmentalist, Mallory. She can't find anything to back it up, though. What difference does it make anyway? I ask in the end. I mean, what kind of relationship can you have with Jack Frost? He just spends all his time running around freezing things, not really caring about anything. Maybe that's the point. She says with an impatient shrug, maybe you could make him care, Owl. And then what? I don't know. Then you'd have a dad who cares? Her eyes suddenly sparkle with tears. Your dad cares. I know. She says fiercely, thrusting the computer aside and pulling a pillow onto her lap. I just wish he'd come home. What's with you and Avery then? She asks later, when we've made the lemonade and cookies portion of the day. And I've been told very firmly by her mother that I can't keep hiding here. Mom is expecting me home for dinner. He's connected with uh, with the Fey world. I say a little niggle of tension writhing in my belly as she frowns. He's been helping me to work it all out. And then I was following one of the Fey creatures and he found me and insisted on coming with me. Coming with you where? What Fey creature? Her eyes bore into me and I shift uneasily. I, I don't know. Some kind of servant of the royal court of Mother Earth, a goblin, I think. I wanted to find out why they've been following me. Following you? Someone's been following you? Why didn't you say that before? She frowns. Why are you putting all your trust in Avery? We don't know him, Owl. He only started at school a few weeks ago. My throat feels dry. I got this wrong somehow. I didn't realize the Avery thing would be such a big deal. He grew up in that world and... I, I needed to know anything he could tell me. Maybe I should have told you earlier. I just, I don't know. I never meant to shut you out, Mal. Everyone does all the time, she says in a stony voice. Mom, Dad, and you. She looks sick, and in spite of my own anger, my stomach lurches because I know I have let her down when she needed me. Mallory's not a drama queen. She doesn't very often actually want much. I should have done more, been around more for her. I'm sorry. She flinches like she's heard it all before. It's fine. I get it. But you should go home now. This isn't getting us anywhere and your mom will be worrying. She gets up and opens the door all flushed and bright eyed. Mallory! Really, it's fine, she says. I need to spend some time with mom anyway. We'll talk at school. She doesn't look at me, and I don't know what to say to make it better. In the end, I have no choice but to leave. I stumble down the smooth, carpeted stairs, past her mother without a word, my head reeling, fingers fumbling with the door latch, 
before finally it yields and I'm back out in the cold, wondering what I should have said, whether there was anything I could have said that would have made it all seem okay to her. I hate that fighting with Mallory. It's all we seem to do since I found out about Jack. Chapter 26. As soon as I let myself into the apartment, there are footsteps pounding on the wooden stairs that lead to the studio. And then mom comes hurling around the corner, flying into me, spattering ochre paint everywhere as she goes. Owl! Mom, what is it? She pulls back. She looks tired and pale, even more disheveled than usual. A gray sweater thrown over her pajamas, all of it sprinkled with ochre in a deep vermilion color. What is it? She shakes her head. My girl, one day you will know what real fear is like, perhaps. And then you will know how I felt when you didn't come home. Where were you, Owl? What were you doing? She's half wild with energy, not exactly angry, but pretty intense all the same. I'm sorry, I say as she herds me into the kitchen, flicking on the lamp on the old dresser and perching up on the side watching me. Paint drips from the brush to the old floor tiles, but she doesn't notice. I did go to Mallory's, honestly, but before that, I went out with, with a different friend. Who? His name's Avery. A boy? Her voice rises with disbelief. Yes, a boy. I feel a bit outraged at her reaction. I might be lying a bit, but it's pretty much the truth. And what's so surprising about me being with a boy anyway? And who is Avery? She asks, narrowing her eyes. He's new. We just met by an old tree and talked. That's all. Oh, this is not going well. What a stupid thing to say. My mind is still reeling from my fight with Mallory. I hardly know what's going to come out of my mouth next. Avery, she murmurs. There's meaning in a name like that bound to be. Maybe his mom just liked it, I retort. And you've got paint all over the floor. She tuts and shakes her head, whether at me or herself, I'm not sure. I grab the paper towels and wipe and help her tidy it up. After which, she starts pulling things out of the fridge. Cheese, hummus, carrot sticks, and handing them to me. She's made little seed cookies and commands me to put them on a plate while she makes miso soup in big mugs, stirring too hard while I watch, feeling a bit nervous. She's preparing for a lecture. I can tell from the flare of her nostrils. She loves a good lecture. They usually make perfect sense, even when repeated five times over. And so... She says, once we've sorted everything and settled at the kitchen table, taking a deep breath as she looks me up and down. Owl, I cannot trust you if you lie to me like that. Did you think I would stop you? I don't know. I just didn't want to say anything. I grab a seed cookie. You're growing up and I'm trying to understand. Put the lying and the staying out. You're still too young for that, Owl. I'm sorry, I say through a spray of seeds. Wow, these cookies are like compressed grit. I know you are, she says in a tight voice, but it isn't. She tips her head back, drumming her fingers on the table. When she looks back at me, her eyes are glittering, her jaw tense. It doesn't change anything. It's the second time in a week and you lied to me. You went out and I didn't know where you were. Or when you'd be home, I didn't know you were safe. I know, she shakes her head. No, this is my time for talking, Owl. You're special. We both know that. And we don't know what that will bring in time. But for now, you are my girl. And I will keep you safe for as long as I can. She hesitates, takes a deep breath. You're grounded. Mom! What did you expect? She demands. There are consequences, Owl, to everything. This is the consequence. You're grounded for one week at least. I've never been grounded before. I never thought I would be. I suppose lots of things have happened in the last week that I never expected. It just doesn't seem fair. I sigh to the Owl on the bedpost later as I open my bag and haul the books out. Fair, fair, comes a whisper through the room, making my ears ring. I look at the wooden owl and around all the others up on the walls, 
There's silence, not a flutter between them, and I almost wish they would come alive and talk to me, because I'm not sure I've ever felt so alone. I tried to get a grip on my math homework, but the loops and whirls of algebra suddenly all look like Jack's frost patterns on the windows, and I get lost again, thinking about last night and the plot against him. <clears throat> I'll have to tell him. Not tonight, but soon. I picture him out there, stalking the streets and covering them with silver white ice. Then I imagine myself out there with him, and I know I won't be able to wait for long. Chapter 27 Fables and Earth Spirits, the Earl of October. It was a flurry and a riot in that place, and for a moment she hardly knew which was up, which was down. Golden leaves spun in the air, rustled underfoot, and drifted every which way, carried on a mild wind. She ran like a child, kicking into the chaos. She could not help herself, but she should have. For the Earl of October is zealous in his rule. What do you do here? He screamed at her, stalking down a long tree-lined avenue, the leaves turning red as he passed. What do you seek? Humanity has no place in my kingdom. He was an awesome sight, half as tall as the tallest tree, his skin like bark. His limbs were knobby his hair like nothing more than the curling, twisted roots that crept beneath their feet. The girl turned and ran. It was the first, the only time she had ever done so. She had faced far more spiteful creatures, even far more dangerous, but there are few in the world who bear the rage of the Earl of October, and there are few who look so monstrous.